Howdy folks, it's time now once again for the weekly Steampunk Desperado Quiz. This week's question has three parts. First one's easy. Number one, what imaginary creature appears in legend and mythology around the world more than any other? Number two, why is it so ubiquitous? And number three, why does it hold such a fascination for us even today? And the answer is, of course, the dragon. Kind of obvious. It was part of the title of, of this week's segment. As far as the other two, they take a little bit more thought. Dragons have been an important component in the human imagination from time immemorial. In legends and fantasy and folklore to modern fiction, including fantasy and sci-fi. They appear in the folklore and culture of many nations. You just don't see Imaginary animals typically, like, for example, the griffin, in so many nations, so many different places. And, and for a creature that's entirely imaginary, unless of course you count the few uh, species of lizards that we've decided to name dragons, including the big scary Komodo dragon, which is pretty cool. But other than that, they're entirely a fable. Why do these creatures hold such a fascination for us? What characteristics do they have in common? Now, of course, they're different in different cultures, uh, and, but they are a lot the same. They do have a lot of common characteristics. As far as the name dragon, it appears to come from a root word meaning to see, which has to do with the legendary idea that dragons can hypnotize people with their stare much like the basilisk in Harry Potter, although that's by no means a, a universal trait. <clears throat> in general, though, they are reptiles, although they're not necessarily cold-blooded, because if they have fire, <laughs> well, they must be martin-blooded, right? They are large and powerful, for the most part, although when you have a tiny dragon, it's almost as kind of a humorous or a joke element. They are intelligent and they can be malevolent and dangerous or friendly and helpful or sometimes disdainful and separate from human society. Often they have wings, but not always. But most dragons we think of as being able to fly. Dragons have composite features of many real-life beasts and these differ on the local culture where the people are talking about the dragons. For example, elephants. They might have an elephant head or tusks in, in India or the head of a lion or a bird of prey in the Middle East or in Africa. Nobody really knows when the stories of dragons first appeared, but huge flying serpent, serpents have been part of the tales of ancient Greeks and Sumerians way back when. In the Old Testament, there's a kind of giant dragon-like sea monster called Leviathan, who is also considered to be part of the dragon legends. And of course, dragons were central in Chinese folklore and mythology. So part of that question, part of that question number two, why is the belief so widespread? Well, there's an anthropologist named David E. Jones who theorized that it's because humans have this innate fear of predators and dangerous animals, including and especially snakes. In fact, almost 40% of all people have this fear of snakes, despite the fact that most snakes aren't dangerous at all. And it probably comes because we evolved to be protective of ourselves and our children. And snakes are just kind of scary. So we magnify that. When we think of the archetypal monster, we kind of make it like a giant reptile. Other people say that dragons evolved or in, were invented because people found the fossils of dinosaurs and they said, where did this come from? What kind of beast could have had these bones? And that in particular probably makes sense in China because the Chinese have been civilized for a long time and they had the, the wisdom and the knowledge to study fossils and to, to ask the question, where did these come from? Rather than just saying, eh, <laughs> we don't care. No, the Chinese were always interested in learning. 
Still other experts say that perhaps the dragon was a manifestation of a living creature, in particular the Nile crocodile, a very scary predator in ancient Egypt. In fact, still scary today. They can move a lot faster than you think, and they can and do eat people. But of course, in general, there's a symbolism. There's a symbolism involved. Of course there is. And dragons represent man's efforts to explain the unknowable. Both the positive effects of nature and the malign forces like storms and tornadoes and volcanoes and things like that. <clears throat> you can always think of a, you know, this storm that maybe there's a dragon up in the sky that is angry at us for some reason. As for my explanation, I think it's kind of a combination of the above with a bit of my cynical worldview projected on it. I think that, yeah, they probably originated from the crocodile in Egypt and from dinosaur bones in China, and they kind of spread all across the huge continent of Eurasia. As far as the other lands, you know, whether Africa or the Americas or Australia, I believe that we Westerners are projecting the idea of our dragons upon their beasts. We want to see a commonality, we want to recognize patterns, and we say, yes, we are all alike, and we all believe in dragons, <laughs> even though they may not, in all cases, be all that much like our original dragons. So, to me, it's kind of like wishful thinking, like a lot of the people who, who believe in the biblical flood saying, oh, yes, every culture in the world has this legend of the flood. Well, in some cases, it's kind of a stretch. <laughs> and whereas it's pretty universal in the Middle East, uh, not necessarily among the Native Americans, for example. I like this quote. I do like this quote about dragons, so I'm going to read it verbatim from uh, Scott G. Bruce in the introduction to the Penguin Book of Dragons. In the ancient world, they took the form of enormous serpents, ready to crush with their coils and kill with their venomous breath. For much of history, dragons were thought of as being like any other mythical animal, sometimes useful and productive, protective, sometimes harmful and dangerous. He goes on to say how when Christianity became popular, that people got this view of dragons as mostly evil, or completely evil, as represented by the serpent in the Garden of Eden, the monster Leviathan from the book of Daniel, and of course, the seven-headed dragon in the book of Revelations, which was supposed to usher in the end of the world. So the dragon's image was very much tarnished by this kind of thought. Until the Renaissance came around and people started thinking, well, we, maybe we can think about dragons as being different. Maybe we don't have to have them all be satanic. Now let's do a little survey of dragons throughout the world in history. A very brief one, because there's so many, of course. The Babylonian god Marduk had a dragon sidekick called Muhushu, something like that. <laughs> and he constantly appears in images of Marduk as being his companion and, and helper, sidekick, whatever. Ancient Egypt, there was Apep, or Apophis, who was, an, it was a deity who represented chaos, and he was appeared as a giant serpent. In China, the dragon was called a Lung, or Long, and it's very central to the culture. Uh, it's the only imaginary creature, for example, in the Chinese zodiac. Another example of uh, just one of many places that appears in Chinese culture is the Mother of Dragons. Yeah, China has its own Mother of Dragons. And she supposedly lived in around 300 BC, and she was a woman who raised five snakes who grew up to become dragons, who were very devoted to her. And as a result, she was promoted to become a goddess. And it represents, in Chinese culture, the importance of devotion of the children to the parents and love of the parents for the children. So that's one of the reasons she's a powerful symbol in China. The ancient Greeks had this monster called the Hydra. Uh, if you recall uh, from your mythology studies, it had multiple heads and anytime somebody cut one off, it would grow back. So it couldn't be defeated. But the hero Hercules was able to do it as one of his 12 labors. It's also a big thing in, big element in the story of Jason and the, and the Argonauts. Now, they went to find the legendary Golden Fleece, which was guarded by a dragon who never slept. Their solution was, of course, to drug the dragon so we would fall asleep and so they could steal the fleece. 
In Viking lore, in the culture of my own people, there was a dwarf named Fafnir who stole his father's treasure and actually murdered his father to do it. And as a result, the gods punished him and changed him into a dragon, which may have been where the idea of dragons being obsessed with treasure came about. He was eventually slain by the great hero Sigurd, so he definitely met a bad end. Dragon-like creatures are also known outside of Eurasia, but as I noted, I think they're a little bit different. I'm, I think we may be kind of extrapolating our, our interest in dragons to these other cultures, but in any case, they're worth noting. The most familiar to us in America is the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, or Kukulkan. He was the feathered serpent, and he was one of the most major powerful gods, and he was reputed as being the wisest of the bunch. It wasn't just in the great civilizations like the Aztecs. Some of the more, some of the less advanced tribes, for example, the Lakota, and several among North America believed in dragons of a sort that were like a horned serpent. The Lakota called it Miniwatu or Unzigila. Cool names. The Incans had their own dragon called Amaru, and he had the head of a llama. And so it was like those many different variants of dragons that based on the local, the local fauna. In Africa, the, the Dahomey people believed that the world was created by a god named Nanabuluku. And Nanabuluku, much like Marduk in, in uh, Babylonia, he had to create a companion for himself called Ido Huedo, who was, of course, a dragon. He was called the Rainbow Serpent. And the dragon's droppings created the mountains, and they also fertilized the soil so we could have plants. And his writhing around in the dirt caused the rivers and the valleys that we now have on Earth. Even the Abor Aborigines of Australia, so isolated from the rest of the world, had their own dragon-like legends, there was this creature that they feared called the Bunyip. And he was said to lurk in swamps, billabongs, creeks, and riverbeds. He was kind of like an evil water spirit, but in many cases he manifested as a dragon-like monster uh, with a form kind of like a cross between a seal and a dog. Returning to Western culture, we have, of course, the legend of St. George, who slew the dragon. He was, of course, the patron saint of England, but he really wasn't English. He was from what we now call Turkey. In the story, he defeated this dragon that was menacing this village. This dragon kept demanding tribute every year. He'd have to have, he'd have, to have livestock to eat. He'd have to have trinkets to amuse him. And eventually, when they ran out, they started offering him a human sacrifice every year. When eventually it got round to the princess being chosen, they said, no, we won't have it. And they called upon St. George to help. And he slew the dragon and rescued the princess, which is one of the, one of the places, one of the inspirations for many tales of knightly chivalry from the Middle Ages. In modern times, we realize that dragons are imaginary, even though we kind of wish they weren't. It would be very cool if they really were real. But we still find them very fascinating, and, and so we see them in all sorts of fiction, and that's especially a staple of fantasy, as exemplified by Smaug, the evil dragon in The Hobbit, who's guarding this enormous mountain of treasure, and uh, the Hobbit has to come in and try to steal it. And of course, he's the invisible, being of invisibility to prevent being cooked. Dragons also appear in C.S. Lewis's series about Narnia. There are plenty of modern books featuring dragons. So many, so many that it's impossible to list them all in a reasonably linked segment. But I'll just mention a few. Primarily among science fiction, it stands out, Anne McCaffrey's series, The Dragon Riders of Pern, which was quite a number of books. Naomi Novik's steampunkish Temeraire novels, of which there are nine. 
uh, there was the Aragon series written by a teenager called Christopher Paolini in the early 2000s, and it was all the rage for a while. And it got made into a movie, and it may possibly be made into a series. And of course, can't leave out Game of Thrones by George R.R. R. Martin, as popularized by the HBO series in which Daenerys uh, Targaryen, the lovely little blonde, becomes the mother of dragons, writing these fearsome beasts around and using them to right wrongs and eventually to rule the world, or so she thinks. Some other popular movies involving dragons in the, in the last few years were The Neverending Story, which was based on a book by Michael Enda. He was German, I didn't realize that, and wrote it way back in 1979. And the protagonist, Bastion, uh, rides this luck dragon whom he rescued. And so the, rag, the dragon owes him and, and lets him ride around. He looks like a giant dog, which is really unsettling, I thought. But he's called Falkor. And uh, he's, of course, made into this movie. And the, the word luck dragon, which is funny, which is what he is, it from, comes from a German word, Glückstrage. And in English, we'd probably just say Lucky Dragon, but they translated his name into Luck Dragon. More, more recently, we had How to Train Your Dragon, which was based on a book by Cressida Cowell, which became uh, one or more, I believe more, popular movies. The first I saw the first, which was very cute, in which Viking boys have to go battle dragons as a rite of passage. There's a boy, Hiccup, who's kind of a loser and a loner, and he captures this dragon, this little dragon called Toothless, and tames, tames it and becomes a hero because he's able to, you know, use Toothless to save the village. And he rides, rides it around. I think Toothless is a she. I don't remember. But in any case, Toothless is adorable. In this case, it kind of looks like a cat rather than a dog. And not lizard-like in either case. I can't leave out Hayao Miyazaki's Spirited Away, in which the protagonist meets a boy named Haku, who actually turns out to be a dragon, who is the spirit of this river called the Kohaku. And I believe he's forgotten who he is because of the humans polluting his river, which was, which was uh, very sad. And, and you know, eventually, of course, the, he's going to come back when humans stop doing this terrible stuff. Dragons are so popular, are so endearingly popular, that they have even been featured in books that are like fake reference books, <laughs> where they pretend this is real and they, and they talk about all these different varieties of, for example, dragons. I bought one of these for my son uh, way back when. It was called Dragonology, the Complete Book of Dragons by Dr. Ernest Drake. Drake, hmm, doesn't that kind of mean dragon? I think that may be a pseudonym. Uh, Dugald, A. Steer, and a number of other, other people. There was a whole series of these kind of cute ology books with lots of pictures and very interesting, fun explanations of things. And it features dragons from mythologies around the world with interesting variations such as the cockatrice and the wyvern and, of course, the Chinese lung. Most Americans are familiar with the top, the idea of riding a dragon, from both from How to Train Your Dragon and from Never Ending Story, and of course from uh, the HBO series Game of Thrones and the lovely Daenerys. And this is a common theme among just about every popular book that involves dragons in a positive way. For example, the protagonist of Aragon. He's, he's a boy who has revived the lost art of dragon writing, which has been wiped out. Other, other, all the other dragon writers have been wiped out by this evil king who wants to be the only dragon writer. There is McCaffrey's 24 book series on Pern. I just kind of dabbled in it, and I'm, I'm currently reading a second book, but there are so many. <laughs> and some written with or by her son, Todd. She's since passed away, so he has to keep up the series. Dragon, dragons, in this case, originated from a local 
species to the planet Pern, and they have this ability to fly and breathe fire, and humans bred them. They bred them as a form of defense against this marauding kind of parasitic life form called the thread that issues out, issued forth every 200 years from this other world that passes by due, due to its erratic orbit. And it's kind of the spore uh, that comes into the atmosphere and it's like toxic to pernish life. So people have to ride these dragons and, you know, burn them up. <laughs> the dragons, when they hatch, they bond with human beings, which is a common theme. They're kind of like baby birds. They bond with human beings and they're so attached that uh, when the human dies, the dragon either pines away or kills itself. For one of her early novellas called We Are Search, McCaffrey was the first woman to ever win the Science Fiction Hugo Award way back in 1968. And, and as such, this, this uh, series continued and she eventually became a grand master of science fiction. My latest obsession, though, is with the temporary books by Naomi Novik. This is a nine-book series set during the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s. If you've ever wondered how history might have gone if dragons were real, this is the series for you. I could talk about it now, but I really think it deserves its own episode. So we invite you all to come back next week for part two of Here Be Dragons, an in-depth review of Naomi Novik's triple trilogy on the Napoleonic Wars with dragons. So this has been my very very exhaustive survey of dragons in folklore and modern fiction. Hope you liked it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below. Please like and subscribe so we can continue to get out the good steampunk word. For now, this is the Steampunk Desperado saying, Adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.